Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this ancillary event on the role of technology in facilitating and combating human trafficking. Before I, I introduce our speakers today, I would like to give you some background about this event. So my name is Borisov Gerasimov, and I'm the Communications and Advocacy Coordinator at the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. The Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women is an international feminist network of almost 100 non-government organizations from all regions of the world. Our member organizations provide direct assistance to migrant workers and victims of human trafficking and advocate for laws and policies to protect their human rights at the national level. I work at the International Secretariat of the Network and we support our members by initiating joint research stimulating exchange of knowledge and experience across countries and regions, and engaging in, inter in international advocacy for the rights of migrants and trafficked persons. As one of our main activities, we publish the Anti-Trafficking Review. This is the first open access peer-reviewed journal that focuses on the issue of human trafficking in its broad context and intersections with gender, migration, and labor. The journal publishes two issues per year, each of which is dedicated to a specific topic and guest edited by an academic with significant experience in this topic. So at today's event, we will discuss some of the research that we published in the journal special issue in April of last year, which was themed Technology, Anti-Trafficking and Speculative Futures and guest edited uh, by Jennifer Masto and Natalie Tucker. This is uh, what the journal looks like in the printed version. I will um, share a link now in the chat box where you can access the articles that we will be speaking about. Um, everything is open access uh, and free for download and reading. So with this background, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed speakers today. Dr. Jennifer Masto is an Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Wellesley College in the United States. She is an interdisciplinary scholar whose research explores the laws, technologies, and modes of governance designed to respond to human trafficking and sex work in the United States. Her book titled Control and Protect, Collaboration, Carceral Protection, and Domestic Sex Trafficking in the United States examines state, non-state, and technology responses to domestic sex trafficking situations in the United States, and she has lectured and published wide, widely on these topics. Dr. Sanya Milivojevic is a research fellow in criminology at Latrobe University in Melbourne, Australia, and associate director of border criminologies at Oxford University. Sanya holds LLB and LLM from Belgrade University's Law School and PhD from Monash University in Australia. She has been a visiting scholar at the University of Oxford, University of Oslo, Belgrade University and University of Zagreb, as well as public interest law fellow at Columbia University's Law School in New York. She is the author of the book Border Policing and Security Technology. The next speaker is Dr. Stephanie Limoncelli. She is Associate Professor of Sociology at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, the United States. She has authored a variety of articles on anti-trafficking activism, as well as a book titled The Politics of Trafficking, the First International Movement to Combat the Sexual Exploitation of Women. Her current research examines the influence of business in anti-trafficking efforts addressing labor exploitation, and the collaborations occurring between business and non-government organizations. And our last speaker is Dr. Angela Quintominas. Uh, she is a CNCA PhD scholar at the University of New South Wales and, technology and teaching fellow at UNSW uh, Law. As a feminist legal researcher, her interests are in the intersections of gender, migration, and work. She is a research associate with the Migrant Worker Justice Initiative and the Social, Social Policy Research Center. Thank you all for being here. Uh, now, one final note before we begin. The presentations of the four speakers will last uh, for about one hour or a little more than this. And we hope to have 15 or 20 minutes for questions by the audience at the end. 
If you have any questions, uh, please write them in the chat box and we'll try to answer them. Now we can begin. And first, I would like to turn to you, uh, Jennifer. You were the guest editor of this special issue together with Mitali Tucker, and the two of you conceptualized it. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about the thinking behind it and why it is important and timely to study the relationship between technology and human trafficking and anti-trafficking interventions? Thank you so much, Boris Lov, and thank you to my fellow co-panelists and for everyone who is joining us today. It's really a privilege to um, be with you to share details about our special issue. So to answer Boris Lov's important question, I thought it might be helpful to set the scene a little bit and um, really to go back about a decade um, where scholars, activists, and policymakers have repeatedly called for enhanced examination of the role of technology as a kind of contributing force to trafficking, human trafficking. And attention to the topic has focused on a range of issues, um, including, for instance, the role of certain technologies like adult services websites or social media as a kind of facilitator of instances of exploitation. Um, more recently, there's been a lot of discussion about the ways that um, data analytics software or other data-driven technologies might be brought to bear in order to kind of identify hotspot risks or hotspots um, of risk for trafficking. Um, and, you know, what's really curious is that in the last decade, the early message that circulated that positioned technology as a kind of um, incubator or accelerant of exploitation has been flipped a bit by anti-traffickers in thinking about the ways that it can be leveraged or the tools of technology utilized in order to turn the tables on, on people who are um, facilitating instances of exploitation and human trafficking. But yet beneath all of these kinds of um, interests and discussions in a variety of sectors, um, including but not limited to the NGO sector, are a lot of assumptions, um, both assumptions about the links between technology as it kind of influences rates of human trafficking, but also that makes assumptions about the efficacy of some of these interventions. And really a kind of key part of this special issue and the broader work that both Mitali and I separately and in this special issue were interested in kind of um, scrutinizing are really thinking about some of the more complicated factors and assumptions that underline discussions about human trafficking. For instance, um, there is a kind of default presumption that adding more apps or adding more um, interventions is ultimately and unilaterally going to do good for people who are in forced labor situations or other instances of exploitation. Um, there are also a lot of um, uninterrogated claims about who might stand to benefit most from these technologies. So I think a really key part of Mitali and, and my aim back in 2018 when we proposed the special issue um, was really twofold, two kind of overarching themes that we really wanted to drill down on and learn from colleagues in the field who had um, focused their research efforts and attention to these topics. So the first big question we were interested to ask and what motivated the topic is, what assumptions underlie um, and animate different types of claims about the links between trafficking and technology. So, so how are they related? Are they related at all? And do we have any data to, to really um, draw some insight from that? A second key theme that we sought to um, account for are really, do we know what the effects of anti-trafficking efforts are to begin with, for instance, um, there are a lot of presumptions, as I as I said that um, a moment ago, that um, you know different technologies will ultimately provide a kind of identification of people in situations involving exploitation, and that will set the stage for other types of aftercare and and justice. But that was a really um, important question we didn't see sufficiently answered in the research that we had reviewed. So part of our special issue aimed to um, bring to bear um, more data on the, the ultimate effects of anti-trafficking. 
And so we have two, um, uh, three papers rather from the special issue, three presenters who are going to describe some of the work that they've done to answer these two overarching themes. Sonia and co-authors work um, really, I think, in a nuanced and critically important way, traces the varied assumptions that they've tracked dating back to the early 2000s to the present day, um, where technology has been framed both as a cause and a solution um, to instances of exploitation. And in their larger work, they, they highlight four main assumptions um, that some of which Sonia may um, describe in, in um, the talk today. But really, I think this is an important piece to really read against the grain of normative assumptions, not only in the spirit of critical inquiry, but really um, to kind of gauge how unpacking these ideologies can help us to assume, um, or can help us to assess rather, um, how ideological assumptions might be the um, generator of policies that are not necessarily effective in meaningfully addressing the needs of people who are in uh, exploitative labor situations. The other two um, sets of papers broadly really get into apps and this kind of app-driven anti-trafficking, um, uh, you know, uh, uptick is something that has certainly been a kind of um, galvanizing force for tech entrepreneurs and different people who are interested in kind of applying uh, ethical consumerism or tech for good in the anti-trafficking space. And Stephanie's work um, in the special issue, and perhaps a piece of it you'll hear about today, really analyzes um, what's kind of happening with some of these apps. What are the um, ideological assumptions here again that comes up, but also some of the methodologies that are not always um, as transparent. So um, this is a way for us to kind of think about anti-trafficking um, as, a, as a kind of form of ethical consumption and the broader insights it raises towards other types of humanitarian efforts that use apps to, to drive responses among consumers. And then Angela rounds out our session today by talking about, um, Angela and co-authors work, talks about um, what's described as digital worker reporting tools. These are apps that global brands aim to collect information from hard to reach workers. And this work really, I think importantly, drills down on what um, you know is doing in the way of workplace settings to kind of amass certain types of data and whether that data ultimately proves beneficial or raises concerns that warrant further exploration. And as a way of kind of concluding remarks, I think our collective and individual um, pieces in this special issue raise timely questions about the future. Um, there was a, a show and tell, so here's, here's another copy. And one of the things I draw your attention to if you have a chance to look at pieces in the special issue is the purposeful word of speculative. Though we are encouraging data, interested in data, we also think that oftentimes technology invites questions about the future. And this um, is certainly a timely moment to really um, take what we've learned empirically, theoretically, methodologically to forecast what the future might look like. And so towards the end of our session today, we'll have the chance to really um, drill down and think more about knowing what we know about some of the tensions ideological assumptions, and sometimes harms of technology, how might that um, insight be brought to bear and really applied um, in thinking about effective policy to address some of the challenges that confront us in a current and then um, post-COVID moment, especially as technology has become such a kind of ubiquitous part of various um, labor sectors. So with that, I will... Um, uh, draw uh, to a close and then um, open it up for my colleague Sonia to discuss her and co-authors work on assumptions of anti-trafficking and technology. Thank you Jennifer for this um, uh, great uh, overview and opening. Um, so yes, uh, I, I give the floor to, to you Sonia to, to share um, uh, your work. Thank you. Thank you, Boris, and thank you uh, to everyone, really, uh, from the organizers to the helpers to the uh, uh, wonderful people who are joining us from all over the world to my fabulous team of colleagues who worked with um, with us on this on this special issue of anti-trafficking review. It's such a privilege to be here. 
Um, even though I would much rather be in Tokyo or Kyoto, wherever it is, goodness, it's 2.30 here in the morning. So I'm warning you, if things go a bit messy, please bear with me. I'll try to be as straightforward as I can. Um, yes, immense pleasure. Uh, I know that we're a bit uh, restricted with time, so I'm just going to um, start the PowerPoint, if we can, please, uh, my wonderful support team. Um, if you can share the PowerPoint slides. Yes, thank you very much. So um, as you can see, this is this is a paper that has actually been um, sort of um, really um, a, a, a compilation of key ideas from the paper that uh, I published with my colleagues, uh, Marie Seagrave and Heather Moore from um, Monash University in Australia, and and so this paper really was a bit of a provocation, to be honest. It's it's as you can see it from the title. Um, it's uh, you know it's been posed uh, to set the scene, I think, for the special issue, and I, I'll repeat some of the stuff that that Jennifer already mentioned. So bear with me while I do that. But I'll, I'll really, um, I mean, I'll use the Jennifer's platform to actually extend. Um, to extend the scene here and try to set it up uh, for the rest for the rest of the panelists, which which is which was our intention uh, with this paper. So um, can we go to the next slide, please? In the writing the paper, um, we realised that um, the our research team um, um, have been working on the issue of trafficking for um, almost 20 years and the issue of technology and trafficking for quite some time too. And we thought that it would be really good to start, you know, learning some lessons, if you like, or trying to see where we're at. Um, what trends could we identify um, in these 20 or 10 years of the intersection of trafficking technology or 20 years of, of our engagement with trafficking altogether? And then some issues, of course, um, that have emerged uh, from from that engagement and from that sort of um, nexus, if you like. And then, of course, um, and we will be, we'll be talking about that towards the end of the of the panel of the session, is how to move forward. What what do we need to do um, to to move forward and to the, to sort of prompt the debate um, to go in a certain desired um, direction. So. Uh, how do we go around it? Can we please go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so yeah, so we um, just before I start, I, I just thought very quickly to give you a bit of a platform on the two key things that we're looking at here. And as um, Jennifer and Tally in the editors for the special issue, I think say it very very succinctly in the in their introduction to the special issue. Um, we need to always have in mind that when we talk about technology, we're not just talking about artifacts. We're not just talking about phones or artificial intelligence or, or Internet of Things or whatever it is. We're actually talking about the technical aspect of technology, but also political and social aspect of technology. We often forget that. And I think in, in our understanding of engagement of technology and trafficking, this was a very important part of, of our analysis. We wanted to see how technical, political and social intersect in our engagement with the issue. I think also important was this sort of idea that technology certainly is not neutral uh, and th that there are certain, um, if you like, um, forces that underpin the development of technology, such as you know, power, expertise, privilege, and, and, and etc. So, in a sense, the, the sort of the, the very um, the, the two things that we're looking at are very um, immersed and emerge from the society, but not uh, not from all parts of society, if you like. So, it's very important to have that in mind. Of course, trafficking for the last twenty years have been, as we all know, garnering quite a lot of attention, a lot of research a lot of policy work, but at the same time, what we've seen uh, working in this field is that the access to mobility and labour at the same time has been decreasing. And this is another theme that we, we thought is very important to, to highlight in our paper. Um, what happened with the new buzzword of modern slavery is sort of a shift in the agenda, really. And the focus is now more and more, I would say, we would argue in our paper, on corporate self 
governance, uh, not so much on labor rights, and certainly not so much on the responsibility of nation states and their accountability, if you like, for sustaining um, or enabling conditions you know, within which exploitation occurs. And uh, when I thought about this technology trafficking thing, I thought about, you know, Roman um, god um, Janus, you know, two-faced god, and, and Jennifer already mentioned that, you know, this sort of idea that we always kind of go between the good and the bad. Um, where is the good in all of this? How can trafficking be the force for the good? Um, in in other words, you know, how can trafficking, how can technology trafficking ne nexus be the opportunity to um, get rid of um, trafficking and slavery altogether or address it in a better way uh, through social media and tech surveillance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, regardless of whether we think about trafficking as an individual or as organized crime, that's always sort of the focus. But also how is uh, this technology trafficking nexus emerging as a risk, as something that will um, further um, exploitation, particularly in the sex industry. And we'll talk about that uh, later in this session. So I won't dwell on that too much right now. Can we please go to the next slide? Thank you. So um, what trends did we observe in our paper? Um, we sort of observed that with a switch to modern slavery, um, this technology trafficking nexus experienced another shift, not just in a narrative as I already explored, but also in terms of the um, how this risk opportunity discussion, debate, uh, narrative actually really transfers and, 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 and is very robust and resistant to any critique to start with. Um, and, and it's been really significant uh, lack of evidence, if you like, or credible evidence, we would say, um, that there is something going on with the technology trafficking or modern slavery trafficking. Um, um, uh, uh, and technology um, in that sense, as both as a risk as an opportunity. There was there was a lot of noise. There was a lot of um, suggestions. There are a lot of implications. There are a lot of assumptions, as Jennifer said. But there's uh, very little credible evidence that we could find. Um, we're also, um, you know, this sort of idea that, especially with the modern slavery surge. Um, and slavery trafficking, uh, slavery uh, technology link, we've seen that this sort of idea that now we're flipping it, we're flipping the narrative from liability to an asset. Technology is an asset. Technology can be the magic bullet that can answer the problem and solve the problem. This sort of uh, what, what in literature is called a tech solutionism, you know, that tech can be what, what can really, really make it or break it. Um, and uh, the growth of what we call the humanitarian um, tech anti-trafficking and its corporatization. There is a lot of a lot of money being made in this process, and and, and a lot of people. And I'll talk about that later, a bit later in, in the paper in the presentation. But basically, there is this very significant trend of um, pushing for the corporate solutions, corporate technology solutions, particularly, I would say, Silicon Valley, but also among the NGOs and international organisations. Narrative of rescue is very much a trend. So we've seen that this is sort of idea and a notion, and again, we're coming back to, you know, 20 years ago when we started talking about trafficking, this sort of idea that we need to rescue the, the sex slaves is now re-emerging again, especially with the, with the context of technology. And very... Few, uh, if any, questions were asked uh, about how technology can actually um, help us address, you know, uh, bad labor conditions and and situations uh, that might lead to exploitation or a limited mobility, for that matter, and inability of large groups of people to cross borders. So, can we please move on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so. Uh, Again, just to recap and very briefly to identify the very key issues that we, we thought um, are very problematic with this whole development. The first one, again, this narrative of a protect and a rescue and not empower is something that I thought it was very, very, um, we thought it was very visible in the debate. And in that process, somehow, um, 
everyone emerge as a potential rescuer. Uh, we can all rescue uh, these slaves by, you know, reporting or ranking the apps. And I know that the, my, my colleagues are going to talk about that later. But this was very, very clear that is, is, is emerging as an issue. You know, we all need to do our bit. If we all do our bit, then, you know, things can be very different and technology can help us do our bit. Um, we've seen the the maintenance, if you like, of the law and order um, or human trafficking, modern slavery as a crime narrative or predominantly as a crime narrative, which, of course, does not um, address conditions that enable exploitations. Certainly, uh, I'm not negating that human trafficking and modern slavery is a crime, and especially not at this event. <laughs> that, that would just be... That would just be political suicide. But um, what we are saying in the paper is that the law and order um, framework cannot be the only one from within the human trafficking and modern slavery should be uh, addressed, particularly in, in the context of, of trafficking and technology nexus. Um, again, um, big issue, silencing of those exploited, but also this sort of idea that, that we're not even going to touch the, the problem of mobility. Or the problem of fair work conditions. Again, lack of research in terms of uh, what we call construction of ignorance, it, which is basically when we don't know, uh, when there is no evidence, we, we, we sort of suggest, we, we anticipate, or we guess. And we've seen that in a trafficking debate in the last 20 years with many, many instances. And this is just yet another situation where because of lack of access, because of lack of um, abil ability to, to find out what's going on, we actually assume. The problem here is that these assumptions were really influential when it comes to policy. Um, if, and again, another thing is, what about the impact of all of this? Where is the harm? Uh, what, what is the you know this very unpopular um, uh, you know term from international relations called collateral damage? Who is a collateral damage here? How do we you know what about if what we do actually further limits mobility and labor rights of those that we're trying to help? What if it leads to over surveillance? Um, another issue that we identified is certainly a lack of transparency, particularly when it comes to money and funding and who's doing what and where the money goes. Uh, and I know that we're going to come back to that, so I'm just going to move on. <clears throat> and finally, and I think the most critical issue is accountability. Who's responsible for harm generated via such policies? And, and shall we start talking about that? Um, and please, can we go to the next slide? So. Um, how do we move forward? And I'll try to be as, as, as speedy as I can here. Um, our suggestion was that we need to sort of start rethinking quite a few things in our approach, not just the human trafficking, modern slavery, but trafficking technology nexus. The first thing is how do we trans translate all of these wonderful efforts, all of these, you know, hundreds of people, um, thousands of people, uh, you know, putting a lot of energy and effort and money into something and how do we translate it into something meaningful like how do we translate it into something that we can measure and see the effects and results at the end of the day um and our first thing was do we need to start thinking about whether the this sort of notion about ending a slavery or rescue or by you know rescuing all the modern slaves by uh, 2030 is actually a distraction or should we really be aspirational? At the end of the day, we're at the UN Congress. UN, UN uh, has been for, for uh, all these years the most you know, aspirational international organizations that set the goals very, very, very high. And you know, is, is it a good thing that we keep setting these goals very high um, and that we indeed need to think about ending slavery and ending trafficking? Well, this is a really difficult question, and I'll, I'll be happy to, to answer your questions on that later in the debate, um, in the question time. But I think, in, in, this was our thinking in the paper, we need to resist simplifications. Um, there is no such a thing as a, a micro-problem micro approach, you know, we all need to do our bit kind of thing, or, you know, Trafficking is an organized crime, therefore we need law and order response, we need, we need um, to give more powers to police, uh, etc. Or trafficking is going to be, and, and slavery is going to be counted by businesses, so they all need modern slavery statements, etc., etc., and get the slavery-free stamp on their products. 
and then we're gonna solve the problem. Um, for us, I think the crux of the problem is that trafficking is a continuum of exploitation and inequality, not just the law and order and criminal justice issue, and certainly not just the micro issue. It's a complex, multifaceted issue. And we need to start by addressing the structural causes of exploitation, such as, you know, um, limited mobility, labor rights, start with the workers and listen to what they have to say, if we can. And I think, and I'll come back to that in a second, technology can help us get there and get those voices. Um, finally, we thought, okay, well, we need to, again, think about accountability and the responsibility of businesses and nation states for creating and sustaining conditions within which exploitation occurs. But also we need to think about harm. And harm is something that is really at the core of this paper. Um, and, and of our work as anti-trafficking experts, I suppose, is we need to understand that everything we do in this field has an impact on, on, on real lives of people out there. And this is what we see in the context of countering slavery and trafficking is harder and harder borders that are more and more difficult to cross. The deportation of those who are identified as victims, their further immobility, their inability to earn money, uh, a lack of re remuneration, et cetera, et cetera. And can we please go to the final slide now and I'll uh, wrap it up because I know that I'm probably running out of time. So our key questions when it comes to technology, slavery, trafficking nexus was, do we need to look at this at all? And again, I come back, you know, I've, I've, I have really am, again, returning to what Jennifer said that we're going to talk at the end of, of, of this panel. Do, do we need to talk about this at all? Um, should we instead focus on 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 creating and sustaining humane migration policies, opportunities for decent work and other economic opportunities, freedom, freedom of association, collective bargaining, improving workers' rights? Or can we use technology to help us get there? Can we use technology to understand these exploitative practices better, to further contextualize the issue? We think yes. Can we use technology to um, assess the impact and effectiveness of these policies rather than, you know, evaluate the process itself? We think yes. Can the technology help us empower workers, give them voice, leverage, remedy? Yes. Uh, and finally, technology can help us monitor prospects, share knowledge and help workers and those in the situation of exploitation to get out of exploitative uh, situations or seek less or no exploitative opportunities, um, safely navigate a very complex maze of criminal justice, labor and immigration systems. We think that technology can play a role here. And uh, in particular, we were looking at uh, artificial intelligence and blockchain, which uh, has a great promise when it comes to transparency verification and providing voice for those in supply chain um, um, in non non transparent supply chains but we think that we need to be careful and cautious we need to be um, very aware of the money um, channels and and a lack of transparency when it comes comes to that so we always have to ask who's benefiting from all of this and is this really um, the road that we wanted to go and to travel to. But I think the most important thing is for us was that while technology can potentially help us tick all these boxes and potentially um, get some of the answers, cannot it cannot replace the strategies uh, that we already have and that we need to create that will further empower workers to improve labor conditions rather than just sitting there and waiting um, you know, patiently and passively to be rescued. So technology has a promise, but it's certainly not all, the, uh, it doesn't give us all the answers, but we do need to have these debates in a more constructive way and we need to find the way to do something meaningful with it all. So on that note, I will end and uh, I'm looking forward to the question uh, questions in, and the debate in the question time. Thank you so much. Thank you to Sanya. Uh, for this really good overview of the main issues. And now um, we will delve a little bit deeper into some of them. So I will 
uh, turn to Stephanie. Uh, your article is titled, There is a Knack for That, Ethical Consumption in the Fight Against Trafficking for Labor Exploitation. Um, and I will just let you tell us more about it. Uh, over to you, Stephanie. Oh, you're muted, Stephanie. Sorry, thank you. I think we uh, needed to get my PowerPoint up. And maybe while we're doing that, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Borislav, you for organizing this, and thank you, Jennifer, for all of the work that you and Matali did on this special issue. Um, and allowing us to be here today. My contribution to the Anti-Trafficking Review special issue is about ethical consumption apps. And uh, I'm gonna repeat a lot of what we just heard uh, because I think that there's some themes here that are really important for us to consider. Um, but I'm gonna talk about them in relation to the particular apps that I was looking at. These are a subset of apps that are used to encourage ethical consumption. They're developed by tech entrepreneurs, uh, sometimes in conjunction with NGOs, but they're aimed at the general public and in particular consumers with the idea of providing them with information so that they can uh, decide to reward good companies through their purchases and punish bad ones through their purchasing decisions. So um, could we go to the next slide? Thank you. This, this paper um, is actually part of a book length project that I've been working on, on business influences in anti-trafficking efforts and the increasing role of the business community in the field. And part of what I'm doing in that broader project is looking at the implications for the other sectors that work on trafficking, especially the nonprofit sector, as well as government. Um, but I'm also considering anti-trafficking strategies and some of the ways that technology and um, you know those those tech solutions might be influencing anti-trafficking strategies so there was one chapter that i have in the book that is considering these issues and this paper is a small part of that chapter so what i'm really doing here is bringing in the role of businesses and thinking about businesses and the the way that technology has been being promoted at and technological initiatives at an almost breakneck speed without a, a concomitant assessment of whether or not these technologies are useful. And this is problematic for many reasons that we've already been hearing about. Um, you know, technology holds a promise as a tool, as, as a tool for addressing human trafficking, but at the same time, they can be used um, in ways that at best are ineffective or at worst may actually harm the very populations that we're intending to help. And this is of course very concerning when it has to do with governments and um, you know, uh, the possible misuse or control by governments using technolo uh, technological initiatives and you know, the kinds of measures that might be in place for ensuring state security but it's also true when we're thinking about businesses and their role in anti-trafficking efforts. So my paper is really a critical analysis of that. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So the ethical consumption apps, these are apps that are, are meant to help us buy our way out of labor exploitation in the global economy. And you know what they basically do, they're, they're structured slightly differently depending on which ones you look at, but overall the idea here is to compile publicly available information, to take that information, digitize it, put it all in one place so that consumers can make choices about what they're going to buy. And the products you know, that are on the apps can be anything from clothing items to household supplies, food, you name it, it's on the apps. This information tends to come from um, places like news media reports or articles or NGO reports and so on. And the apps tend to then rank 
products and, and brands um, based on some sort of ranking. It could be a grade ranking like an A to an F. It might be a numerical ranking like a one to a five. But um, whatever the ranking, the idea is that uh, consumers are going to look at those rankings and then make purchases of better items if what they're considering is deemed to be uh, an item made with exploitive labor. And could we go to the next slide, please? And this is a very appealing idea. It really reinforces the notion that, you know, there's an app, there's a technical solution that can help us to fight a complex problem like labor trafficking. And it's a simple thing. It's a, it's a pleasant thing. It's a painless thing. Um, I confess that I too have, you know, thought about what I'm buying and, you know, bought a sweater or a pair of earrings because I, I felt like I was, you know, doing something good. So I can admit to doing that. It, it seems like a nice thing. It's very appealing. But, you know, are these apps really positioned to do what they say that they're going to do? Um, to find out, I really looked at three of them and in great detail. And the three apps that I looked at for the paper were Bicot, Good On You, and Shop Ethical. Um, Bicot is a free app with over a million downloads at the time that I was doing the research. And it's developed by a, a small privately held company based in the United States. And it has a barcode scanner so that you can use your app to, you know, look at particular products before making your decisions. And the app has user generated campaigns um, about various uh, human trafficking issues, including child labor, slavery and uh, fishing supply chains and sweatshop labor. Excuse me. Um, and so that's that's one app. The second one, Good On You, is a privately held company as well, uh, owned by its founding members, as well as the nonprofit Ethical Consumers Australia. It had 100,000 downloads, and it's focused mainly on clothing, so clothing, footwear, and accessories. Um, it ranks brands from you know a number of one to five, with five being good. And it has sponsored blogs and it also includes algorithms to suggest brands for consumers to buy so that if you find one you know product that isn't um, considered ethical enough you can click on a link and go to a website and make a purchase through that link uh, shop ethical is the third one it's a paid app a little different from the other two it's a project of the ethical consumer group which is a nonprofit in australia um, it also has a bar code scanner so that you can look at a huge variety of prod products, again, with links to products that are presumed to be more ethical. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So what I did was analyze the structure and the content of the apps and the supportive information that I could find uh, from the developers. And I wanted to highlight several problems that I think there are with these apps. The first problem is that there's issues with the data and the methodologies that the apps use. So it's really about what information is collected, how it's collected, how it's used. And while the apps seem to provide a kind of a objective assessment of products and brands, in reality, it's much more complicated and the data and methodology are the reason for that. Part of this has to do with the information that they rely on, which has to do with information that can be uh, ad hoc, whatever happens to be out that a particular organization or media company might have reported on. A lot of times the information is incomplete, out of date. There's contradictory information about products and brands. And I mean, part of it is just the enormity of the project of trying to, to keep track of the thousands of products and the relationships of all of the different brands and their parent companies. Um, but what it means is that there's lots of misinformation on the apps and you can find recommendations for purchasing, you know, a particular product rather than another, but it turns out that they're both being produced um, by the same company. And in addition, the apps tend to rely on users to scan new items and add items that might not already be in there. 
So, you know, what you find when you look in practice is that this crowdsourcing tactic doesn't really work that well. So you can find a lot of times that you're looking for products and they're, they're not actually available or there's limited information on them. So couple this with some methodologies that are used for the rankings that are not exactly transparent. And, um, you know, you can find a lot of contradictions about what you should be buying and who you should be buying from. Um, it's not uncommon to find a company that could be ranked highly on one app and then ranked poorly on another. And a lot of the information is just there and decontextualized and really hard for users to make sense of. So instead of, you know, actually providing a sort of simple method for making assessments, it seems that the apps attempt to quantify things and provide the rankings actually does the opposite. All right, we can go to the next slide. A second problem that I wanted to highlight with the apps is that we don't really have accountability or transparency for the apps or the app developers. Um, you know, when they provide links to alternative kinds of products and companies to suggest that people buy from, they um, are actually making money off of these links. So you follow a link, you make a purchase, and uh, a certain amount, a commission gets kicked back to the app developers or whoever the owners of the apps are. And so, you know, there's a commission involved there, but there's no guarantee that the companies that are being recommended are actually um, ethical or that their products are ethical. So we have no way of guaranteeing that the that the information that are, is on the apps is actually accurate or objective. So um, that's an issue. In addition, the apps themselves um, collect information on the users, presumably for marketing purposes. And they take a lot of that crowdsourced information that the consumer has co-created by feeding in information into their databases, and they use it to sell to other companies. So. I think that both of those things are, are issues that consumers should be aware of and should think about, you know, the idea about what's being collected on them, how it's being used, and what their role is in co-creating, you know, um, information that becomes a product itself that gets sold to other companies. So the upshot of all of that is that the apps themselves um, it may not surprise you since the users are so valuable to the app developers that the apps themselves are so focused on the user consumer and not necessarily the workers that the apps are intended to help. Um, and in fact, that's another criticism. We can go to the next slide, which is where are the workers in all of this? Um, they're not directly involved. They're not central to any of the apps. The apps don't use workers' inputs. Um, they're not asked their opinions about what consumers should be buying or doing in order to help improve working conditions. In fact, the way that the apps are set up, workers are only a sort of an object or a means to help the apps thrive rather than the other way around. Can we go to the next slide? Thanks. And in fact, this is, uh, I think, one of the biggest issues with the apps. And my last criticism here is that, um, you know, when the apps are, are telling us to be the solution by voting with our wallet, that we as an individual can decide, you know, what, what labor exploitation is, when it's happening, and what should be done about it when they tell us to wear the change that we want to see, and when they explicitly tell us that we should be looking beyond government control of the way we live and how companies act, they're really reinforcing neoliberal tenets about the importance of individuals and individual solutions, as well as you know, creating a kind of a, a normative expectation and reinforcement that governments themselves do not or should not play a role in these efforts. And, you know, we were hearing a little bit about this before, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about it as we go along. But you can go to the next slide, please. But I think it's it's really, really important. These 
individualized solutions, these technical individualized solutions to social problems that are really complex are problematic. And of, of course, I say that as a sociologist um, <laughs> because I, I'm really interested in you know, organized social action, but I'm also interested in the way that you know, we might think about policies and programs um, and means of preventing and ameliorating labor exploitation in the global economy um, that you know, is not gonna be being addressed if we're so focused on the individual. In addition, I think that it's a problem for us to try to shift, continue to shift responsibilities away from states and onto consumers. Um, states do play a role here. States can do something very important they can regulate working conditions, they can ensure decent work for everyone, they can make sure workers have the right to organize. Um, they can do something about corporate malfeasance, but you know, none of these things are occurring if our focus is on the individual and on ethical consumption. And my last slide, please. So what to do here? Well. There's a lot that we can do. I think that uh, we can ask governments to do those things that I was just alluding to and the things that civil society groups and labor groups have already been asking for, which is for governments to uphold labor laws, for them to guarantee the rights of workers to organize, for them to take measures to ensure decent work. And that means decent work for everyone at all levels of supply chains as well as migrant workers and those in informal work who are often who we find so vulnerable to conditions of trafficking and they can do something to address corporate malfeasance i mean we know that corporate self-regulation hasn't worked with corporate social responsibility efforts in the past with the sweatshop movement and so on we we know that that doesn't work but count me as skeptical that ethical consumption apps will um, work any better. So, so pressing governments to uphold, you know, a decent work is one sort of really important thing I think that they can do. But the other thing when we get back to the role of technology is that technology can be used for good. It's a tool. And so if we could uh, figure out how to, to develop technological initiatives in ways that partner with and support vulnerable workers, then I think um, we might be able to do some good. And of course, there's a big caveat there, which is that it's really important in the process by which we do that development of those technological initiatives, and that it's really important to work with workers. Um, and I think we're gonna hear a little bit more about that in the other panels. So, or the, but from our other speakers. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to Stephanie uh, for these really important points you made. And uh, yes, we will turn now to, uh, to Angela Quintuminas, um, who will be speaking about uh, the, another type of apps, uh, the ones made. Um, well, anyway, I will, I will let you uh, introduce Angela, your, your article and tell us more about it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Boris Lab, and thank you to um, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. It is a great pleasure and a privilege that I am joining this terrific panel as part of this ancillary event on technology and human rights with you today. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to acknowledge that I am joining this, this meeting from the Bejigal lands of the Eora Nation, where the University of New South Wales is based in Sydney, Australia, and I pay my respects to the Indigenous Elders past, present and emerging in the lands that I live and work. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Angela Kintominus and I'm presenting today on a paper that was featured in the special issue, um, co-authored with Laurie Berg and Bessina Farbenbloom. Uh, who are my colleagues at the Migrant Worker Justice Initiative, which is an initiative between the UTS and UNSW Law Schools. Um, so if I could just ask for the, the PowerPoint to magically appear, thank you. Uh, 
Okay, so Aha, uh -huh, beautiful. Thank you very much. And on to the next slide with the overview. Thank you so much. Okay, so in this presentation today, we're going to consider the role of technology, specifically digital worker reporting tools in the supply chain context. So as many in this audience, I'm sure are very well aware, multinational businesses are now facing immense pressure to identify and address the risks of exploitation, trafficking and modern slavery in their supply chains. These pressures are coming from consumers, from investors and from shareholders and have also arisen in a context of new regulatory momentum with due diligence and modern slavery laws as well as lots of voluntary industry guidelines. So it's in this context that digital reporting tools have rapidly emerged in the last several years, seeking to promise some sort of way to cut through the complexity of global supply chains and reach out directly to workers themselves via their mobile phones. So in this presentation, what I'd like us to do is to try and contextualise the emergence of these tools within the broader political economy of privatised neoliberal supply chain governments, governance. And so this presentation is divided in five parts. Um, first, uh, just a quick introduction to contextualise digital working tools and a brief comment on method. Second, I'll seek very briefly to provide a landscape on digital worker reporting tools, explaining in brief terms how they work, what they do. And then I'll move to the challenges. So issues around the data that these tools actually collect and whether or not they can reflect the core problems that workers face. Secondly, thinking about the outcomes for workers and whether or not these tools present a worker-centred approach. And thirdly, thinking about the whole new suite of risks and challenges that using technology brings to vulnerable populations, such as workers in supply chains, in relation to safety and privacy. Uh, so next slide, thank you. So over the past three decades, retailers and brand companies in the global north have increasingly sourced goods from the global south, giving rise to complex and decentralised transnational supply chains, which are inherently dependent upon cheap labour in developing countries. Downward cost pressures and short production times have amplified these demands for, for cheap labour, and migrant workers are especially vulnerable to abuse, and including forced labour and trafficking, where they've accumulated debts that compel them to work in whatever conditions are imposed by recruiters or employers. The limited success of social auditing, inspections and other traditional methods of supply chain governments have demonstrated that data gathering is very difficult, it is costly and it is corruptible. Access to workers is hard. This is because of complex subtracting arrangements where most workers in those factories and farms and fishing vessels are well below the first tier of suppliers. So workers in third, fourth and fifth tier often have the poorest working conditions, but they remain out of reach of traditional inspections and audits. Digital tools have therefore emerged um, seeking to, uh, to cut across that complexity of global production by reaching workers directly via their phone. The lure of technology is that it is quicker, it is easier and it is more cost effective to gather data at scale. However, as I hope we can explore in this presentation now, the work um, that businesses need to do is to have a genuine interest in leveraging um, a, a genuine interest and a capacity to actually leverage to address worker exploitation. And tools need to be designed primarily for a human rights protection and a worker-centred approach and not just risk management. Uh, and a note on kind of the context of these research findings. So this is based on a scoping study conducted primarily in 2017 and 2018, where after a, a literature review, myself and, and my co-authors interviewed 55 individuals across the sector, including digital developers, multinational businesses, migrant rights organisations and trade unions, and government agencies and regulators. And so obviously a next step in this research is... Um, um, research that works with migrant workers and other workers themselves directly and um, research that's more field-based. Uh, so if we could move next to the landscape and functions, thanks. So what do these tools actually do? Uh, it's impossible to completely map a very fast shifting landscape, but in this section I'll briefly canvas some broad features and points of divergence. So these tools solicit data directly from worker themselves, which 
um, makes them different to other tools like blockchain or data visualization tools, although sometimes these tools can feed into them as well. They typically seek responses via a limited number of closed questions. So um, from one to five, how safe do you feel in your workplace? Using IVR, that is Interactive Voice Response, USSD, or Unstructured Supplementary Data Services, or SMS. So these have the benefit of workers not needing a smartphone to pay to, pay to use for data, and they can accommodate lower levels of literacy. The market compromises of for-profit businesses and social enterprises that sell platform services or data back to lead firms, so they don't necessarily have an anti-trafficking or migrant worker specialisation. Data can be procured at the level of the work site, such as the factory, or they engage at a community-wide level and then sell that data back to companies. However, there are some tools developed by unions and not-for-profits or public-private partnerships, although it's dominated by for-profits. The form of data collection does vary um, depending upon context to specific factors such as connectivity, literacy, smartphone penetration and factory and worker preference. As more complex technologies become available though um, through using apps such as um, those on smartphones, we can expect more privacy and security challenges um, accompanying the more complex technologies. Data collection is typically anon anonymous but not always and uptake is incentivised through phone credit and monetary awards and sometimes by physical outreach. Uh, so if we can move now to the next slide, thanks. Worker reporting tools present an unprecedented opportunity to collect first-hand data directly from workers, especially those below the first tier. But whether that data is ever accurate depends upon a range of choices that's made by a data collector, which workers are targeted to seek feedback from, how those topics are framed, what gets left out, the design and implementation of the tools such as user testing and rollout, and then how that data is analysed, aggregated, presented and shared. These tools have also emerged within a broader socio-cultural moment of a, of a booming global indicator culture, which is defined by our faith in the rationality of numerical and quantitative representations as somehow being complete and and accurate representations of circumstances. So the first consideration around data quality is that businesses have the capacity to determine the scope of the issue on which data is collected. So they may not want to collect information that reveals the true depth or extent of a problem and instead ask questions that are framed to elicit a benign response or avoid sensitive topics. So the data may present less serious issues than the company is willing that the company is actually willing to address. So for example, talking about low quality food provided to workers at a work site or in accommodation, as opposed to talking about more serious issues of labor exploitation. The data might, not al might also not necessarily reach most the most vulnerable workers. And we can draw here upon the literature on the digital divide, which tells us that Despite a proliferation of smart, smartphone ownership worldwide, factors such as age, income level, gender, IT environment, so for example, if you're in a, on a fishing vessel far out at sea without connectivity, migration status, these all continue to limit and structure the quality of access to technology. And so this needs to be paid attention to. Ultimately, also, there are big trade-offs to be made about the capacity to capture large-scale data and data that captures individual experiences um, and the subjectivity of those responses. And at the extreme level of exploitation, uh, a complex and individual legal determination would be context specific and would always still need an individual interview with that worker to provide an outcome. Uh, so if we can move to the next slide, thanks. Outcomes for workers. So what are the outcomes for workers using these tools? Ultimately, it's unethical to collect sensitive data from vulnerable populations and to ask for their time and for their contribution without then using that data to meaningfully improve workers' circumstances in the longer term. It also can damage the capacity to engage with the same population in future where they've given their time and contributions and have not seen an outcome through engaging with that process. These tools are often described as a worker voice initiative However, a worker-centred approach requires that a supplier or a brand collaborates with workers and representatives around what issues are important to them and then 
Uh, it also requires that once data identifies a problem for a company to take a specific measure in response to the feedback given and then independently evaluate those measures um, according to timelines and deadlines. But a worker-centred approach and a risk management approach can often cut in different directions. For example, if, if a serious issue of labour exploitation is identified at a particular factory, a risk management approach would be to, to cut and run, that is to remove the factory from the supply chain. But such drastic steps can lead to very, very poor outcomes for workers who are left without a job and have large debts to pay and may risk being removed um, because of their migration status being compromised. More fundamentally, there's a risk with digital reporting tools that they actually perversely diminish worker power, where they passively acquire individual segments of data from workers in ways that do not actually amplify worker voice through collective organising and action. Companies can, can seek then to justify avoiding engaging with unions or collecting bar collective bargaining on the basis that they've already spoken to workers. And then unions face challenges in accessing data or exposing gaps in that data or distortions in that data because they aren't given full access to content of that data or they lack the training of resources to do a probing analysis. Uh, and uh, next slide, thanks. So in the previous um, slide, we've explored some of the, the challenges in uh, securing outcomes for workers. And here um, I'd like to explore some of the potential harms that arise from using technology specifically. Any tool that extracts data from vulnerable populations ultimately also brings with it inevitable risks. So this may be because it collects personal data intentionally or as a byproduct. So, for example, a third party could access a worker's phone or a central database might be hacked or its data might be leaked. So this leads to a number of possible harms to workers, such as immigration officials being alerted to a breach of visa conditions, data being shared back to a um, immediate employer or manager who then may retaliate, personal security threats, job loss. So these initiatives need to therefore protect workers' safety and privacy by ensuring that workers' data is collected, stored and used and then at the end of its life cycle disposed of in a responsible manner. And that's, this must be in line with legal data protection frameworks and also with emerging good practice. This is especially the case where risks are not going to be immediately obvious to workers or in countries with weak security or rule of law. So therefore, it's important that workers' informed consent is always obtained, but these tools often operate in a context of, comp of a comp competitive commercial market where there is a strong disincentive for an honest appraisal of actual and possible risks. Uh, one approach is to formulate a theory of harm, establishing a taxonomy of the worst possible harms and minima mitigation strategies that need to accompany them. But the minimisation of risks is obviously not straightforward and will always require trade-offs that have to be carefully thought about in advance. So, for example, collecting anonymous data from workers or less data from workers um, can protect their anonymity, but at the same time a lack of information means it makes follow-up around serious um, human rights abuses very difficult. So, um, in conclusion... If we can move to the concluding slide. Within complex global supply chains, worker reporting tools have been presented to us as, as offering new opportunities to gather high, high quality information from workers about their labour and recruitment conditions at scale. However, as we've outlined here, gathering high quality data remains difficult. And where high quality data is somehow collected, this is obviously only the first step. Deeper uh, efforts to meaningfully engage with labour exploitation, trafficking and modern slavery will always remain expensive, time consuming and require, require organisational commitment and leverage. There is a risk in the framing of these tools that the problem is somehow distorted as an issue only of data acquisition or a lack of information. This diverts attention to already well-known drivers of exploitation where simply having more quantities of data does nothing to automatically solve an issue. Nor does a technology address the macro structural drivers of exploitation. Reducing labour costs remains the easiest way to reduce overall costs and increase profit margins. 
So worker data does not rebalance this, these power asymmetries necessarily. This always is going to require genuine worker voice through freedom of association and collective action. Therefore, we can see that digital worker reporting tools are not somehow a panacea um, to worker exploitation and they do not change the political economy of privatised supply chain governance. In fact, they are embedded in it and they have evolved from the very same sorts of social auditing practices which have similar risks. They do hold some potential, but their efficacy depends upon businesses being committed to invest in resources to ensure data collection is robust, that, th that any initiative is something that takes worker safety and privacy very seriously and that um, there is a meaningful commitment to follow up once problems are actually identified. Thank you. Um, and just the, the final slide there, um, further information can be found on the MWJI website. Terrific. And Jerome, uh, so I, I want to get back to Jennifer, but before that, just a quick question. There was a question in the chat box whether uh, we can share the presentations. Is everyone okay? For your presentations to be uploaded here in the uh, in the file section of the uh, of the platform. Yes, yes, that's fine with me. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, so either uh, the, our support from the UN or I will uh, will upload the um, the presentation. So. Uh, Jennifer, I want to get back to you um, now. Uh, so th there is a, a sort of a third broad uh, theme in the special issue, um, and this revolves around uh, shut the shutting down of websites hosting uh, adult content as a measure of preventing trafficking. So I would like to ask you to um, take perhaps around five minutes to, to share um, about this and perhaps another, let's say, five minutes for um, sort of like a general conclusion of uh, what we find in the issue and a reflection on uh, the role of technology in trafficking and anti-trafficking. Thank you so much. And for that last five minutes, I'd really love to invite my co-panelists to jump in and, and share some of their own reflections and also to encourage any folks who might have questions to share those in the chat from anything you've heard so far or anything you'd like to engage perhaps um, across the, the panel. Um, I'm looking at the time to ensure that we do have some time for questions. You know, one of the things that um, is kind of um, lurking in the background to this discussion are the ways in which um, tensions that have more broadly surrounded anti-trafficking efforts, namely around um, um, sex work policy and the links or um, purported links between instances of sex trafficking and, and how they do or do not overlap with sex work um, has really come up around technology in a way that I kind of succinctly described as a shut it down methodology. So over the last um, decade, a really core approach to addressing um, assumptions and reports of exploitation taking place in online spaces um, where uh, various types of sexual ser services are exchanged, uh, whether coercively or by choice, um, the kind of tactic of first default effort has been to shut down websites. And one of the core themes that came up in this special issue um, are some very specific policies in the United States. And I'm talking and referring here to the 2018 passage of the Allow States and Victims to Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, or FOSTA, which really kind of um, took pre-existing tensions surrounding online classified ad sites and really changed a, a critically important provision. Um, I'm aware that, you know, for folks who are outside of the United States, um, a discussion about FOSTA and its socio-legal effects might be very idiosyncratic and not perhaps as um, relevant to the context that you're in. But one of the things I think might be very helpful just to kind of illuminate is that a core feature of FOSTA um, was a change around liability. So in the past, 
uh, where um, internet providers or third party um, platforms were given some kind of immunity carve out from being held liable for different content posted on um, third party sites and networks. Um, Foster really upended that. And I think if you're kind of wondering what's the link between what you've heard so far, it's really a changing idea around governance. So rather than say, um, you know, law enforcement being the kind of default actors of first response, what FOSTA did is to really um, effectively deputize third party actors and networks to anticipatorily police their networks. And there are a lot of different, I think, um, ramifications of that that came up in some of our um, pieces in the special issue. And I think that have purchased for our discussion about the effects of technology more broadly um, in, in two particular ways. One, I think what FOSTA reveals is a broader networked um, strategy that's afoot said in a slightly different way that rather than kind of think about um, the uh, enforcement of anti-trafficking laws as solely the province or role of law enforcement, what it reveals is a kind of shifting idea around legal enforcement of certain issues and increasing reliance on third party actors and companies to kind of police networks and scrub content presumed to be um, uh, linked to um, fostering exploitation. A kind of, I think, second um, piece to this that we haven't talked about, but this is where the speculative part comes in, is that within this kind of networked anti-trafficking or anti-slavery strategy, um, new types of technologies um, are being kind of brought to bear to anticipate or use ostensibly predict future risk. And if I can kind of bring it back to um, the discussion that we've heard from different contexts and, and, and examples, what I think really comes through is that there is a lack of data uh, in general around the efficacy of some of these tools. And yet it's the very data that's being collected that could be also used to predict future instances of, tra of, of trafficking or slavery in the future. And I think that for me is a way to transition to the future in thinking about um, not only what the data are doing, but what um, concerned um, actors um, uh, might think of the fact that some of the tools being used in the service of anti-trafficking prediction or prevention may themselves be um, based on not only flawed, but potentially um, compromised data that could um, have injurious effects. So for me, a really big question that I think um, is important in the work that I'm doing beyond the special issue are, what are some of the political, ideological, monetary, um, uh, you know, and, and other types of entanglements, oftentimes ideological and power entanglements that shape some of these anti-trafficking um, assemblages. And when I say assemblages, really what I want to think about um, going back to some of the presenters' work is what does it mean um, if I take some of Stephanie's insights um, up, what does it mean that businesses are seen as, as kind of prime responders to certain types of labor exploitation? Or, um, you know, Angela's work talking about like these tools and this very sophisticated kind of inventory of ways that data is ostensibly used. And yet at the end of, uh, at the, end of the kind of exercise, um, workers are not necessarily better protected. And I think this also gets to Sonia's very important mapping and provocation that um, despite the idea that technology is part of culture, technology and culture and society are inter intermingled, um, how do some of the very durable inequities um, that might not seem as sexy as a nap, but are still critically important. How did those get kind of um, taken out of the discussion or even evaded altogether with a kind of tech solutionist discourse that circulates? So I think something for us to really think about is if indeed, and the kind of key terms that came up a lot in this presentation and certainly came up in this special issue around ethics, transparency, accountability, um, harms, risks, um, I think a question for us to really consider is who are the arbiters of, of evaluating, assessing, and holding to account how these different tools are used and to what effect? 
And I think this becomes really complicated in a landscape where there's an increasing focus and even emphasis in some contexts around collaborative governance. Um, it's not a key part of the issue per se, but governance issues really recurs in a lot of our discussions. So I think for us to kind of collectively talk aloud about um, what the future might look like in terms of how do we build in accountability in a moment where there's a heightened emphasis, for instance, on collaborative governance or different kinds of networked approaches that on, on the surface seem to bring more people to the table or to use Stephanie's great kind of tagline, you know, everybody can be a responder and do their part. Um, but the, um, let's say, uh, effects of that kind of crowdsourced effort um, also raise really important and I think unanswered questions about um, what are the kind of remedies that exist? Have we even conceptually thought of them um, when these apps, when these data collection techniques do more harm and have you know, uh, longitudinal effects, um, some of which we still have not even begun to map in its entirety. So these are some kind of like broad brushstroke ideas. I also wanted to um, see if any of my co-panelists might wanna add anything in terms of future questions or topics that you're grappling with on any of the topics you talked about in your presentation or that have come up in some of the other panelists' responses. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, we have uh, nine minutes at the moment. Um, so I, I see that there, there are no questions. I will paste again uh, the link to the special issue in the chat box for anyone who would like to read more. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to again to Sanya, Angela, and Stephanie for any you know final words to, to wrap up. Not more than two minutes uh, each, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Boris. Um, I think um, uh, there's so much that has already uh, been said. I think, but but uh, for me and and um, Jennifer, thank you for for summing it all up really in a very very tight sort of set of conclusions. But for me, really, what one of the key things is is how do we um, you know frame uh this whole debate in a in a in a different and more productive way and whether we can really use technology to help us understand the problem better rather than to address it that really is for me the crux of the of the of the question mark and the puzzle that we we're, we're trying to solve you know can can all these as you said you know um, is is collecting data going to you know, result in, in, in less data uh, or, or can we actually, you know, really understand the problem better, understand the impact better, assess the current, um, you know, interventions that we have and, and really just um, uh, flip the coin here rather than thinking about technology as an opportunity, as a, as a, as a risk or whatever in this sort of binary model, um, can we actually leverage um, technology to give us some answers about the social, you know, that I go back to that um, from the beginning of the presentation, what technology is, you know, it's political and social and, and trafficking and, and modern slavery are political and social, complex political and social issues, moral issues. Um, you know, we need to be able to, to untangle them a bit better. So I think for me, uh, what I will be doing in the next couple of years, hopefully, is is trying to see if we can harness technology to provide some of those uh, answers and contextualize the issue a bit more for us as researchers, as policy makers, as as people who just want want to assist as NGO, as a frontline workers, but finally for for workers um, down the line who are we trying to assist. So you know. Uh, you know, the promise of a blockchain is one thing, um, but but really, again, we're not talking about the solution. We're talking about, uh, you know, deciphering the problem, trying to understand it better, assess what we have, and see how the new and emerging technologies can actually help us deal with all these issues and understand them a bit better in the future. Well, that's me. Thank you, Sanya. Um, and we have a question in the in the chat box, which I think um, 
could be linked to to Stephanie's article. Stephanie, would you like to uh, to answer uh, the question reads regarding what was said about um, apps shifting responsibility from states to consumers? We are an NGO based in Argentina, and the question we get the most from people is, okay, I'm aware now that contemporary slavery exists, what can I do? We usually turn to responsible consumerism uh, or consumption. What would be the answer to that question, do you think? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I think it's a good one. Uh, I guess what I would suggest is for people to direct people to NGOs, to any civil society group or labor group that is already working on these issues and ask how they can contribute. I mean, there are concrete ways that we can um, try to address particular policies, that we can press governments to you know, uphold um, the enforcement of, of, labor, uh, of labor laws that would improve working conditions for workers at all levels of supply chains and in the informal economy. And so I guess this is part of the, the sort of suggestion, the overall suggestion of the paper to um, get away from the sort of individualized responses and try to do more collective responses. And I would hope there'd be a lot of civil society groups, campaigns and labor groups and unions that would have concrete suggestions about policies and programs to help direct people to um, and to use that, that collective will to try to press for that change. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, Angela, would you like to add a few, uh, a few words, just one or two minutes uh, at the end? Thank you. Uh, I don't have much to add after that brilliant um, summary by Jennifer, and I'm happy to um, see if there's any further questions. But I guess a theme that has... I feel like percolated um, in this panel today is a need to interrogate the underlying assumptions behind what a problem and then what its solution are framed to be and to interrogate exactly what this theory of change, theory of change actually is. Um, and it's problematic when we have uh, technology introduced as, as offering some sort of seismic break or reset from the problems that we already have a lot of experience in dealing with and have a long history of dealing with and where there are people on the ground that have had a lot of experience working on um, because those sorts of approaches um, tend to evacuate us out of the political economy in which trafficking, forced labour and other human rights violations are occurring. Um, and so rethinking what the problem is and what the solution is is going to really help. Um, the problem is not necessarily a lack of data um, on its own. Thank you, Angela. So I, I guess one final word from me too. Um, for us as the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women, as a, you know, as a feminist human rights NGO, um, it is, uh, I, I would like to go back to what Sanya was saying in the beginning that um, the the reasons why tra why trafficking or uh, modern slavery exists is because of lack of economic opportunities and social protections uh, in people's lives and lack of uh, uh, mobility right to mobility or regular migration pathways. So all of these things, which have nothing to do with technology, these are the things that uh, we would like to see governments uh, address and. Um, you know, create opportunities for people rather than uh, create um, apps, which, uh, uh, as many of you reflected, are uh, not always helpful. And there are all kinds of issues with uh, surveillance and uh, data protection and privacy. Um, so, uh, yeah, from our perspective, to the solution to trafficking should be in social, economic, and political. Um, will uh, rather than uh, technological solutions. Uh, so with that, uh, I, we have just seconds left. I would like to thank uh, the four of you very much for attending this event uh, and for, uh, to, for speaking and to everyone who attended the event. I hope it was helpful. Uh, thank you and we can uh, end the streaming now.